Well, my dear friends, we've made it to the end of the year, and it's time to celebrate. You're not going to sit back and relax with your favorite drink this evening. You're going to party with me and a lot of my dear, dear friends from the YouTube storytelling community. We've got a fantastic lineup for you this evening. Um, some ensemble stories featuring a lot of us uh, together, <laughs> and a few guests as well, who are going to be reading stories for you as part of our celebration this evening. Well, once again, it is time to sit back and relax if you want, or time to get up and party if you feel like it. And we have a real treat to begin with this evening. Two of my um, go-to storytellers, the ones that I listen to when I'm not busy reading. We have a fantastic story featuring me, <laughs> Nature's Temper, and G.M. Danielson. Are you ready for the excitement? Well, let's get this party started. The Ghoul of Valley Forge by Mr. Evan312 Bloody hell, I'm starving. Those dreary words often echoed around the camp of desperate, bloodied souls. Some spoken aloud, others only passed in pained whispers, or simply purveying the entire atmosphere in the Valley Forge encampment. Morale was incredibly low, lower than the temperature. The flashing steel and the blood-red uniforms of the British Army were as far from everyone's mind as the ragged band of patriots languished in the cold. The biggest danger to the Continental Army did not come from without, but from within. No enlisted man, officer, nor volunteer did not know hunger. Without proper supplies, they'd taken to eating anything from roots and tree bark to cotton or sawdust, just to fill the howling voids that were their shrunken guts. What Solomon, or Sully, as his comrades called him, did not like was that the words came from Arthur, his closest friend. They were dragging a wrapped, stiff corpse of a perished fellow patriot through the surrounding forest. The look in his eyes as he sized up the body gave Sully a strange feeling in his stomach. He could not fault Arthur that much. They wore ragged uniforms, or at least what passed for uniforms in this outfit, none of which did much to prevent the cold from seeping into their very bones. They carried muskets over their shoulders, which they'd fired in anger at the English and both of them had killed men before. Yet, just like many of the boys in this so-called army, they could not call themselves true hardened soldiers. Even those true soldiers that remained were in the same boat as the rest. Officer or low ranking, the hunger, misery and the cold were truly equalizers. What's wrong, Sully? The boy tried biting his tongue. Arthur was younger than him, not by much, but he acted even younger. He was a rash and flighty youth. Sully made sure to stick to his friend like honey to keep him out of trouble. But like Arthur's hunger made him impulsive and morbid, Sully's made him incredibly irritable and quick to anger. And this time, he gave in to the rage. Must you always say that whenever you look at a corpse? He barked harshly. God damn it, Arthur. These are people. Sully dropped the feet of the body causing his friend to stumble under the weight as he stood to take his full height. Christ, if you so much as think of that sort of thing again... I'm not, Arthur protested, the look of hunger replaced with one of shame. He nervously rubbed his hands on his threadbare sleeves, trying to warm his stiff, achingly cold fingers as best he could. I've just... I've been hearing things in the camp. He's keeping Washington's horse under armed guard. I wonder what they're getting paid to keep their chops off that thing. I bet you'd feed a dozen men for a week. I'm long tired of boiled bark and moss. Sully folded his arms tightly to his chest, hugging what was left of his already thin blue and red trim jacket to his pronounced ribs. Like Arthur, he'd forgotten the feeling of a full belly, forced to subsist on little more than a few scarce roots that they dug from the winter-hardened soil. Can't enjoy the meat when you've got a noose around your neck with a bullet in your liver. Don't make me teach you what becomes of those who give in and eat human flesh. Arthur suddenly froze in place, turning only his eyes to lock onto those of his older friend. A pale look had entered the boy's rosy, frost-nipped cheeks. Please spare me, Sally. You know I hate those kind of stories. And so he did. Arthur was in many ways a fearless lad, never scared of his fellow man. He was a fierce fighter in battle for his smaller size, reminding one of a scrappy wildcat. 
However, Sully knew he was terrified of the old wives' tales of what stalked in the dark. More than once growing up, Arthur had slept with a lit lantern or curled up by the fire after his father or his brothers had teased him with stories. The story of the Scottish banshee from their ancestral homeland gave the boy a particular fright in his youth. So much as hearing a female yell in the distance could set him off. Sully was not so cruel as Arthur's family and friends, so he kept those tales to himself. However, just because he did not speak them aloud did not mean that he was lacking a few yarns of his own to spin on some nights around a fire with the men. Many of the natives who he'd made contact with, such as the Lenape, had their own ghost stories tied to the land itself. These were just tales, however, stories to scare children or fools like Arthur. But Sully was no fool. He was certainly no longer a child. He knew that man only had itself to fear. After a moment, the two picked up their ends of the corpse again. They'd nearly forgotten about it, standing quietly and awkward in the cold as the snowfall became thicker around them. They did not speak now. Arthur was ashamed of himself, and Sully simply having no more to say. At least, having starved to death, this body was not very heavy. It was all they could muster the strength to shuffle about their job at little more than a snail's pace. Their hunger and the cold had cost them both a great deal of sleep. There was no proper burial place near the camp. Sickness was already ravaging the army, and the last thing anyone wanted was to bury the dead too close by. A few soldiers, who had simply withered away from hunger, were elected to be buried deep in the woods, in a small clearing Arthur had found while on patrol. By now, even in the now surprisingly thick snowfall, the two knew their way by heart, and by now the corpse seemed to be growing heavier. It had become easier to let down one's guard in the banal, dismal conditions. In these close quarters, the only thing more familiar than one's fellow soldiers and their grumbling stomachs was the daily monotony of waking up, starving, and trying to sleep. The woods around the camp had long since been harvested to the bone. The animals were virtually gone, and any roots, berries, or even carrion had been inevitably devoured. Vigilant patriot scouts made sure that no one, not even the stealthiest natives, could penetrate the defences. A shame, Sully thought to himself, because he would have traded his month's ammunition ration, perhaps even his musket, with a Lenape warrior for a scrawny rabbit or a couple of squirrels. And that's why, when Sully looked past Arthur's shoulder into the clearing, he stopped, dead in his tracks. Just ahead in the pale gloom of the falling snow was a small pile of frozen corpses. The two boys had been working much of the day to prepare them for burial. They'd been wrapped in white linen, which was rapidly blending with the forest floor, as snow began to dust the rotting leaves and dirt. This made it stand out even more. Leaning over the pile of bodies was a tall figure, completely hidden under a long, cream-coloured coat, with a black tricorner hat atop their head. The coat had been well made, yet was incredibly worn and tattered, covered in dark stains, and the green colour and cuffs all but faded to a washed-out drab. Sully knew that regimental colour was part of no army he knew or had ever faced. Still, he could swear that he'd seen that green and cream-coloured sword of coat somewhere before. The figure seemed to be rummaging through one of the cadavers, having discarded its burial sheet off to the side. What immediately alarmed Sully was that this man was set to be buried without any clothing or possessions, for uniforms were preserved to be given to other recruits that needed them. So... This meant the newcomer was, in fact, not merely interested in pickpocketing the dead. It was clear that this person was interested in the only earthly possession this lost soul had to offer. This revelation sickened Scully to his stomach, and rage began to boil in his blood. Dropping his end of the burden, he swung his musket off his shoulder, raised it to his shoulder, and leveled it in the stranger's direction. Just what do you think you're doing, friend? His deep, harsh voice rang across the clearing with an unmistakable echo. The stranger stopped whatever it was doing and was frozen in place. What are you playing at, Sully? Arthur, his back still to the sea, glared at Sully in confusion. 
with a speed that neither of the boys had ever witnessed in a living creature. The figure whipped around to meet them. Sully's weapon began to shake when he noticed the figure had not turned, but rather only its head had somehow twisted around to look him in the face. This had not been an arcing twist or the craning of the neck, reminding Sully of one of the wooden neck hinges from one of his father's puppets. However, this action did not sicken him nearly so much as the face of the figure. If it had once been human, that had clearly long been abandoned or stripped away. The shape of its head clearly matched a human skull, but the skull was almost the sum total of what remained. Whatever flesh that remained hung in thin, desiccated, tattered strands. Bits of it even hung loose like drying lichen. The teeth were jagged, brown, broken with bits of flesh stuck between them, and the lower jaw was smeared with cold, thick, dark, congealed blood. The eye sockets looked like they'd been long empty the sightless eyes having perhaps been stolen by carrion birds. In their place, the sockets poured forth a thin trail of what looked like white smoke or mist. The two stood and stared at each other. If what the figure was doing could even be called staring, for what felt like hours, did not so much as waver or shift position from where it silently considered these two intruders upon its gruesome meal. Even Arthur did not so much as budge, fixated on the absence of colour in his friend's face. Arthur, Sully spoke quietly, not sure if he was trying not to be heard by the creature or to mask the quiver in his voice. When I give the word, throw yourself to the ground. What the hell is it, Sully? What the devil's behind me? Damn it all. Just do as you're told. Now. Everything seemed to happen slowly in Sully's eyes. Arthur began falling to his right-hand side. His finger, rigid with frostbites, curled tighter around the trigger of his brown bess. A cloud, like gun smoke, slowly curled from his lips as he let out a breath to steady his aim. Arthur's foot lifted some of the rotting leaves from the forest floor into the air. He could see the hammer of the flintlock begin to plunge towards the priming pin. Sparks from the flint drifted into the air like leaves in a breeze. Priming powder slowly began to spark, and then blaze brightly. So he could swear he saw everything happen at once at that moment. And yet, in the midst of all this movement, not once did he see the figure even twitch. It stayed motionless as a stone. The musket thundered and bucked backward, filling the area with smoke and shattering the deathly silence like a hammer to a crystal glass. Solomon had positioned himself well to handle the recoil, but he did not even notice the weapon's substantial kick. He stood with bated breath, Arthur having twisted to look behind him from where he lay on the forest floor. They stared into the cloud, neither of them sure what to expect. It finally settled and cleared, revealing the figure to be sitting exactly where it had been before. Sully was at a loss for words. He was certain he'd hit it full square, right beneath the left shoulder blade. And that's when Arthur raised a trembling finger towards the stranger, pointing to the back of its coat. Mother of Christ. Sully, look. Sully's aim had been true, striking the stranger right where his heart should have been, producing a clear hole. However, no blood was coming from the wound at all. This was an injury that should have been spraying that vital fluid across the forest floor or spreading in a crimson stain upon the coat. Instead, all the two could see was a black, seemingly bottomless hole, from which drifted a wisp of that strange pale smoke. The creature, for it was already clear this was inhuman, was entirely unperturbed. By God, wh wh what are you? was all Solomon could bring himself to say. With the hushed utterance of these words, the thing leaped into action, moving like a mere blur. Sonny's gut instinct kicked in, dropping his now useless musket. He threw himself on top of Arthur in a gallant, brotherly action. Draping his larger frame over that of the boy, he braced for the clasp of a cold, dead hand around his neck. Yet, 
he did not come. When Sully dared to crane his neck and see, the figure had instead taken the corpse by the ankles with its rotting hands. Quickly lugging it out of the clearing, it had already reached the tree line. The corpse had taken two boys to carry, yet this monster moved with the strength of three large, well-fed men at once. In its hurry to leave, the corner of his great coat had snagged on a protruding root. However, seemingly not noticing, or just ignoring the inconvenience, it merely continued along, and the coat was discarded on the ground. This gave Sully a full view of the horror he had just encountered, before it disappeared with its grisly prize forever. It had a human shape, walking on a pair of legs with two arms, but it more closely resembled a bedraggled scarecrow. Almost all of its skin and muscle were absent, as if this were a corpse picked clean by vultures, yet miraculously continued to walk afterward. It was almost pathetic to look upon, as if a stiff wind could carry it away. The few shriveled tendons that were left seemed barely sufficient to hold the bones together, never mind provide it with the unearthly strength, speed, and grace with which it moved. There was undoubtedly something incredibly dark and unholy that drove this wretch past the point of death, if it had ever been alive in the first place. All the two boys could do was stare at each other in absolute shock of what they had just witnessed. They were uncertain about what they'd actually seen. They were not sure of when the alerted Patriot sentries had come running to the scene of the gunshot, demanding to know what had happened. They were at a loss what they would say to their commanding officers back in the camp. But one thought was foremost on the two young men's minds. Their appetites and shriveled stomachs had been thoroughly vanquished from the forefront of their minds. Well, I think you can all agree that was a very fine start to this evening's uh, celebrations. Two of my favourites, as I said, so if you're not familiar with their work, how can you not be? But if you're not, go and visit their channels. I've left links to them in the video description below. Oh, what's more, we have a very special Christmas message from GM Danielson. <laughs> Hello, friends. This is GM Danielson. Wishing all of you Dr. Creepin fans a very Merry Christmas. I am so grateful Dr. Creepin requisitioned me for the part of Sully in the story. Our good doctor, as some of you know, has been very generous with his narrative talents, supplying me with several stories for my channel of late since Halloween 2019. And when he asked, I was very much glad to give back the favor. I certainly hope everyone enjoys this chilling winter tale, and if you could, please consider stopping by my channel this Christmas. <laughs> it certainly would unfreeze my blood this season. Farewell and happy, happy Christmas. <laughs> Well, you heard the man. Why don't you drop by his place and Nature's Tempers and give their work a listen to if you're not already familiar with them. Now, it's time to move on to our next story. And in this one, I'm very, very happy to introduce the wonderfully talented Kyra the Doll. Ashes to Dust by C.J. Canatelli I woke up in a pool of sweat, gasping in the humid air. The atmosphere was heavy and I felt sticky from head to toe. My matted hair expanded, unable to handle the environment I'd fallen asleep in. I sighed, tossing myself back onto my mattress. I closed my eyes before I hit the bed and felt my heart stop in my chest as a cracking pop boomed through my window. My eyes shot open, and before I knew what was happening, my bed frame collapsed in on itself, sending my waterbed toppling onto broken wood. Another quieter popping sound ripped through the air. I gasped as I sank into my waterbed, which erupted and spilled everywhere, soaking my boxes. It took me a few seconds to get a grip on a splintered section of the baseboard of my now dismantled bed. What the fuck? Before I could pull myself up, something occurred to me. Something was very wrong. There were a couple of small rays of sunlight creeping through my window, which was, apparently, boarded up. The cracks in the wood were enough to let the bare minimum of light enter the room, but 
Not enough to see anything through. What the hell happened? I thought. Dad! Dad, what's going on? Silence. Nothing but my words echoed and trailed into nothing. My room was destroyed. My laptop had apparently suffered a fall from what had once been my desk. Trophies from high school were scattered into shattered pieces across the dust-covered carpet. Upon closer inspection, I realized it was hot ash. What the hell had happened here? I tried to open my bedroom door, but something heavy was blocking it. Blind with rage to mask my terror, I slammed myself into the door seven or eight times without even getting it to bite found my phone. It wouldn't turn on, even though it was plugged in. An electrical fire, perhaps. That didn't explain why I was here instead of a hospital. I covered my mouth and listened. For the life of me, the only sounds I could hear was the thumping of my heart and the rush of blood travelling to my aching head. Help! I murmured to no one in particular. Help! Oh, God! Oh my god, someone, can anyone hear me? Help, please, God. After a few moments, I collapsed, feeling a tingling sensation in my legs. Everything felt so heavy. I suddenly became very disoriented. Who am I? I thought. I know this place. This is my home. Where the hell did everyone go? I braced myself against the wall and attempted to catch a glimpse through the narrow boards blocking my window. It seemed bright outside, but silent. Maybe not so bright, but lighter than the black abyss that had once been my bedroom. I began to cough, barely covering my mouth before blood pooled out of it. I collapsed to the floor landing on a stray newspaper on my ash-covered floor. November 9th, 2021. Nuclear war imminent. So, uh, short and not particularly sweet one there. A bit of a downer, but, um, well, you know, more stories are coming up very soon, my dear friends, I promise. <laughs> so that was Kyra the Doll featured there. Uh, please go and check out her channel, uh, doing all I can to support her on her journey into the world of uh, YouTube storytellers. Well, this has been an interesting year for me, certainly. Um, big move, moved my family over from Turkey to the Netherlands, and um, it's a really beautiful place, really enjoying living here, but um, lots and lots of bureaucracy, and of course, um, having gone full-time YouTube this year, in the last couple of months, um, I have to prove that... Uh, I can support my family through the channel, which has not been the easiest of things. But all in all, um, everything's been going pretty well for me. Can't complain. Life's good. So many of you are always uh, showering me with such uh, positivity in the comment section of the videos. Can't help but uh, be enjoying life. Yeah, so one thing that was a bit of a downer, I got a copyright strike a month or so ago. Um, bit of a kerfuffle. I didn't do anything wrong. Turns out the person whose um, footage I'd used had uh, licensed it under a Creative Commons license that they didn't really want to. And, well, uh, tricky situation, this one. I could have pressed the issue and um, ended up just demanding that I get to use their footage, which um, seems a bit weird. I could end up sort of, ca not suing them, but counteracting their uh, claim against me. And um, I would have been in the right, but it just seems a bit weird, isn't it? You know, they've done, they made the video and it was uh, on the... Um, edge of space, the upper atmosphere, so as you can imagine, not um, an easy video to make and cost a lot of money to produce. And like I said, they had licensed a stit under a Creative Commons license, so I did absolutely nothing wrong. And um, well, you know, you always try and look for a good outcome in these situations. And uh, we talked a lot, me and the person in question, and um, well, we've come to some kind of resolution. Um, didn't really help me as much as I wanted, but you have to uh, always try and find positives in every situation in the world. Not always easy, but, well, I think it's an outlook that sort of definitely helps me keep going in life. <laughs> anyway, that's a bit of a waffle, isn't it? I will be waffling on a little bit between these videos. Not all the time, but occasionally. So please indulge me, dear friends. 
So what have we got now? Ooh. So this is another one with a very impressive ensemble cast. <laughs> I, of course, will uh, be telling the story. And I'm joined by the wonderful Mother Raven, by Tales to Chill the Bone, and also by the wonderful Swamp Dweller. So, you got a drink in your hands? Are you ready to party some more? That sounds good to me. Well, here we go then with our next story. Skin and Bones by Nerd Neil. I don't like her. She's weird, complains Travis, arms crossed and pacing back and forth. Look, bud, answers Trevor, anxiously watching out of the living room window. I have to go to this meeting, where I could lose my job. Kim and I have been dating for a long time now. I really like her and wouldn't trust anyone else to watch you while I'm gone. It's just for tonight, and this will give you a chance to really get to know her. Who knows? By the time I get back to you, you two might be best friends. Doubt it, Travis replied. Trevor sighs and turns to his son. Travis, ever since your mom died, I didn't think I'd ever find another woman that I could feel this way about. But Kim is different. I really like her, and I think that we might actually get married someday, if everything keeps as good as it has been. I get it. You miss your mom, and I do too. But I've got to move on. I'm not asking you to like Kim, just because I do. I just want you to give her a chance. Please. For me. This makes Travis feel a little guilty. He hadn't really gotten to know her all that well, but Kim really freaked him out. She was a very tall, very skinny woman that kind of reminded him of Momo. She had long black hair and a huge pair of eyes that looked like they could pop out of her head if she tried. Her face was constantly covered in heavy amounts of makeup, and she drenched herself in strong perfume to the point that he could literally smell her coming. To her credit, the few times that Travis had actually met Kim in person, she was actually very sweet and friendly to him, but her appearance made him extremely uncomfortable. Rolling his eyes, arms still crossed, Travis replies, Fine. Not too much later, a black car pulls into the driveway and a tall figure wearing a long fur coat steps out. As she comes to the door and rings the bell, Travis is immediately hit in the face with the strong smell of her perfume. Well, he coughs. It's definitely her. Be nice, replies Trevor in a stern voice. Trevor opens the door, and Travis can't help but shudder as he sees the image of this alien-looking person standing in the doorway, her huge eyes staring gleefully at his father, and then quickly to him. Hey, bud, Kim squeaks in a high-pitched voice. Are you having a fun night? Her smile is stretched wide, showing off her way too white teeth. Oh, yeah, answers Travis, unenthusiastically. Super fun. For a second, it kind of looks to Travis that her left eye twitches just the tiniest bit after he says that. Travis swallows hard. Trevor invites Kim inside and she gives him a huge extended kiss. Travis has to keep himself from gagging at the sight of his father making out with this strange-looking woman. Eventually, Trevor leaves for his trip, meaning that Travis was now alone with Kim, and his dread began to rise quickly. At first, things are relatively uneventful. Travis stays in his room playing video games, and Kim sits in the living room watching TV, periodically checking Facebook on her phone. Eventually, it was time for dinner, which, to Travis's delight, Kim just ordered a large pizza. They sat at the dinner table, and Travis was shocked at just how much pizza Kim had eaten. He often wondered if she ate at all, but she easily put away half the pizza within ten minutes. Travis wanted to ask her how she could eat so much and be so skinny, but he was afraid to offend her again. Hey, Kim? He starts. Yeah, bud? She replies, chewing on the latest slice of pizza she'd started on. I was just wondering, um, how it is that, uh, well... You want to know why I'm so skinny, right? Travis nearly chokes on his own slice. Uh, yeah, actually. Well, I have an extremely high metabolism, which means that my body burns calories a lot faster than other people. 
I actually eat quite a lot, believe it or not. But no matter how much I eat, my body just stays the way it is. Oh, okay. Travis feels really bad now. He feels like an ass for thinking she looked scary because of how skinny she was, and it wasn't even anything she could control. Sorry. Don't worry about it, bud. She says, finishing the last of her meal. I know I look funny, but it is what it is. As the night progressed, Kim and Travis actually started to bond pretty quickly. They played video games together, and then watched a scary movie. Eventually, it was bedtime, and after brushing his teeth, Kim bid him goodnight and he crawled into his bed. After about half an hour, he realizes that he needs to pee and makes his way to the bathroom. After he does his business, he notices that Dad's bedroom light is on. Realizing that it must be Kim, an idea comes to him. Now, Travis is a 12-year-old boy, and dirty thoughts as well as genuine curiosity began to come to him. He wonders if she's changing, or maybe even just completely naked. Maybe he could get a quick peek. He'd never seen a real naked lady in real life before, and he especially wondered what Kim looked like without clothes on. Sneaking close to the door, he slowly turns the knob. It's not locked, to his relief. Even slower, he opens the door a crack, just enough to peek inside. What he sees is not what he was expecting. Kim was standing in front of his mom's old vanity, but something was very wrong. Sitting on the table was what at first looked to be a mask but soon became clear to be something sinister. It was Kim's face. Not just the face. It was basically her entire head minus the skull. Slowly and shakily, Travis turns his attention to Kim's head, which was literally a pale white skull. Travis didn't even care that she stood there completely nude like he had hoped. He was too transfixed on the freaking skull with two large eyes. Travis then watches as she begins to remove her skin as though she were taking off one piece pajamas. She reaches inside of it and pulls out what appears to be a large sack. She takes it to the small private bathroom and Travis can hear her dumping something into the toilet and then flush it. She comes back, folds the skin and places it in a large black box that was laying on the floor next to the video. Finally, she pops out her left eye and places it in a small bowl of water on the table. And then she does the same with the right eye. She turns off the light and slowly shambles her way over to Travis' bed. Travis slowly closes the door and silently freaks out. Not knowing what to do, he slowly walks back to his room and climbs into bed. He does not sleep this night. The next morning, Kim gets Travis out of bed for breakfast. They sit at the table, eating the scrambled eggs that Kim had prepared before getting him up. No words are spoken at first, until Kim breaks the silence. I know you saw me last night, she says flatly. I don't, um, I don't know what you're talking about, responds Travis, refusing to look at her. Stop, she says sternly freezing Travis in place. Just stop. I know you saw my face. My real face. I know you watched me. I thought it was my imagination until this morning. You're acting like you've seen a monster. And I need you to understand. You are a monster! Travis yells, cutting her off, immediately regretting that decision. Kim's face becomes sad. Look, bud, there's things in this world that you wouldn't understand. Yes, there are monsters in the world. Real monsters that would have killed you in your bag the second they suspected you saw them in their true form. But I didn't, because I'm not a monster. <sighs> Am I human? No, not really. Do I mean you harm? No, I don't, but you need to understand that Beings like me are not understood by regular people, so my existence has to stay between us. 
I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to scare you. But I will protect myself and others like me. Terrified yet understanding at the same time, Travis agrees to not speak of what he saw to anyone, ever. Later that day, Trevor returns, and Travis nearly knocks him over as he runs over and hugs him. Wow, bud. Trevor laughs. I've missed you too. Did you two get along? Travis looks over to Kim, who stares at him with a somewhat worried look on her face. Yeah. He answers, genuinely smiling. She's actually pretty cool. We had pizza, played some games, and watched movies. I like her a lot. He looks over to Kim, who is smiling brightly. Kim gives Trevor a big kiss and gives Travis an even bigger hug. Thank you, she whispers in his ear. Travis whispers back. You can trust me. I am trusting you, too. And with that, Kim leaves, and Travis waves goodbye. With a newfound respect for Kim, and new questions about what else is out there, he walks over to his dad to ask how his trip was. So how are you doing out there, everyone? Having a good time? Enjoying the party? I do hope so. So um, thanks once again to uh, my three guests in that story. Please go and check out their channels, all doing phenomenal work, telling you some wonderful stories here on YouTube. Now, oof, I'm getting a bit tired. I need a little bit of a sit back and relax myself. Grabbing my own favourite drink, a white Russian for those who are interested. And we're going to let a couple of my dear friends have a little go themselves, okay? So, um, first up, who have we got? Oh, we have the incredible Mr. Creeps. Now, we got to work together pretty early on in his uh, YouTube career. And since then, his channel has skyrocketed. He's doing phenomenally well. And with good reason, um, he does fact really, really good work. So if for some reason you're not familiar with Mr. Creeps' channel, go check him out as well, okay? Highly recommend it. And he has a little Christmas message for you, which is this. Simply, be kind. The smallest thing could make a huge difference in someone else's life. There you go. So, over to you then, Mr. Creeps. Itchy by Sylvester Cooper You know that feeling of an overpowering itch? And the type you can't possibly resist scratching? It's truly annoying, isn't it? It usually starts as slight irritation of the tissue beneath your skin, as though it was being pricked by some sort of thin, fibrous probe, intent on driving you insane. Another maddening trait of a terrible itch is how it jumps randomly to another patch of your epidermis. This seemingly random jump is made all the more irritating in that it always takes place after you've either satisfied the itch's original location, or when you've mentally pushed the urge aside. This relocation is also usually to a spot several times more sensitive to the irksome itch. This jump can repeat a number of times, until you're driven into a mad fit of scratching. And then your skin gets all red and irritated, and if you're not careful, you may draw blood. For a fraction of a second, you might think the itch and its ability to jump randomly around your body seemed a bit too calculated, as though there had been a wicked intelligence behind it. And then you would think better about it. And call yourself a fool for considering such a thing. You even take medication, believing that you might have suffered from a potent allergen. Well, you would be both wrong and right. Your itch wasn't caused by a bit of pollen, mold, or animal dander. Okay, sometimes they can be the cause, but not nearly as often as you would think. No. There is usually an intelligence behind a terrible itch. How do I know, you may ask? Well, I'll tell you, you silly human. I'm the intellect behind the itch. Well, either me or one of my siblings. Now don't try and find us. The greatest of your hunters couldn't find one of us in an open field on a sunny day. So don't bother trying. What are we called and what do we look like? 
Well, I won't share a name, but seeing as impossible for you to find us, I'll give you a brief description. We are roughly the size of a small child, but our arms are longer than a grown man is tall. Our faces are wide and usually sport fiendish grins, especially if we have driven a human mad from itching. The nail, talons, or claws, whichever you're more uncomfortable with, extend out from our three-fingered hands. They can slither across entire rooms without a hint of noise as they seek human flesh. With painstaking patience and incredibly skilled strikes, they embed themselves deep into human tissue like hypodermic needles in a thousandth of a second. And then they retreat, waiting to strike again. Hmm. Why do we do this? Well, the same reason why I'm writing this. To screw with you. Jeez, you would think a species as smart as you think yourselves to be would be able to figure that out. Unpleasant itching, everyone. Very, very kind of you to tell us that story there, Mr. Creeps. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Go check out his channel, as I said, doing phenomenal work. As is my next guest, Being Scared, another channel I've worked with um, on several occasions and, of course, will be working with again in the future. So, how's life going? It's going very well. Thank you so much for asking. Cool. All right. Do you have a Christmas message for everyone? I do. During the holiday season... Don't worry about the past or the future. Just cherish those around you. Your friends, your family. Just look around you. They are all that matters right now. Awesome. Thanks again for being part of this. Now, on to the story from you. Killing my childhood monster was easier than I thought. By Nerd Core Neil. I never thought that I could do it, but there we were. I did it. I thought that it would be hard, but it was so, so easy. The idea of ending a man's life, with my own hands no less, gave me a great sense of anxiety before. The act of it, however, was so much more satisfying than I had ever thought possible. Don't get me wrong, when I say that it was easy, I do not mean the literal action of taking his life. He put up quite a fight, as he was so much bigger than I was. He always was, after all, which made him so intimidating when I was a child. For so long, the pain he inflicted on me went unpunished, because I was scared. I was scared that if I told anyone, I wouldn't be believed. I was scared that if I had attempted to defend myself, he would hurt me so much worse. It's funny, when I was finished... I looked over at him lying there, weak, helpless, dead. He was a monster, a cruel, evil beast. The only regret is that it took me so long to finally put him down. It sickens me to think about how many other children had to suffer because of my silence and inaction. I hate that it took the idea of him touching my boy to finally do something. The first time my boy came to me, and told me about it. I knew who it was right away. I had always hoped that my own childhood trauma was all in my head, that I imagined it, but it had always been a reality. When my boy told me about the tall man, I shuddered. When he told me about his long, skinny arms reaching out to him, I cried. When he told me about these cold, dead eyes staring at him as he choked him to the point of near death, before releasing his grip, I was done. Tonight, as the boy slept, I hid in his room, and I waited. I waited all night long. I almost believed that it was all in his head, as I had previously imagined it was in my head, until I saw it. I saw the doorknob turn, and I could feel my heart racing. The door opened, and there it was, the tall, skinny silhouette. It became bigger as he began to walk toward the boy's bed. I gripped my baseball bat and struck first. 
He turned around in surprise as I swung with all my might. He dodged it at first, and then he grabbed me by the throat. He cursed as he screamed at me before I smashed his face with my forehead. I quickly grabbed the bat again and swung once more. The bat broke in half as it smashed over his head. He screamed so loud, and it was so disturbing that I almost threw up, but I kept my cool. He fell to the ground and I mounted him. Remembering my childhood, I began punching repeatedly, thinking about how he hurt me. I kept punching. Thinking about how he hurt my boy, I began punching harder. I kept punching until there was nothing left to punch but the floor, stained with blood and fragments of bone. When I was finally finished, I took the time to calm down and think about the situation I was now in. I look over to the boy, a look of shock, fear, and confusion on his face. It was then that I remembered that he was not my son, but my patient. I then remembered that it wasn't my monster that was hurting him, but his own. I remembered that my own monster is still out there, hurting God knows how many children, and until I find him, I'm going to settle for the monsters of other children who come to see me in my office. This was the first, and there are so many more to go. Lucky for me, my mask hides my identity, so the boy doesn't know who I am. All he knows right now is that he won't be hurt anymore. Before too long, the light in the hallway turned on, and I could hear his mother call out to his father. I quickly escaped from the bedroom window that I snuck in, and could hear the scream of the mother calling out the name of the father. I killed a monster tonight, though only the boy will ever know, unless he decides to tell the police about the abuse his own father had inflicted on him. I have so many patients with their own monsters that I need to deal with. Parents, teachers, and every other monster that has touched these children will be hunted and slaughtered. One day, I will track him down. I will kill my own monster. Well, I don't know about you, but I've really enjoyed this evening. So nice to be able to bring so many of these fine storytellers together for one big giant party and share all the fun and entertainment with you all. You know what? This is the festive season. It's not just one evening, is it? So, let's do it all again tomorrow night. I have got some of the biggest names in the business lined up to uh, work with me tomorrow, so let's keep this party going one more evening. What do you say? You gonna join me again? Okay, I hope you will. Well, until tomorrow, very, very sweet dreams. Go and have some fun, all right? See you again real soon. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>